Hi, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to the statistical learning uh, session. So, let's just quickly recap the slides that we went through in our previous session. Yeah. <coughs> we started off with the learning objective why statistics, measures of central tendency, measures of dis uh, dispersion, descriptive stats and distribution. I think I stopped at distribution level, right? So why statistics? Uh, increasingly everything that we are doing is becoming data oriented, fact oriented and all companies want decisions to be driven by fact and that's where machine learning analytics and all machine learning analytics is backed by numbers that's why we need to have the knowledge of stats. The number skills that we should have, so till here we all have got the number skills probability distribution and today we have central limit theorem and normal distribution to be covered, right? <coughs> Different types of numeric variables, measures of central tendency, mean, median, mode, measures of dispersion, standard deviation, variance, range, interquartile range. So what is the objective of dispersion? Why we need dispersion? To see the spread of the data. More spread, more heterogeneity, less spread, more uh, squeezed the data is, homogeneous data it is. And uh, very nice application from a marketing standpoint. If the customers are more spread, which means I need to cater to different target segments and according to that I need to have different offers, different product designs. How to uh, show data, one slider where I try to put how we should see data, right? If it is a categorical variable, frequency distribution, proportions, cross tabs, if it is a continuous variable then uh, measures of central tendency, measures of dispersion and if it is discrete variable uh, where we have to see frequency distribution, proportions and mean mode. I just saw the frequency distribution of the rating that you gave for me my last session. So the mean came out to be very good 4.5 above and most of you have rated me 5. So analysis, right? The various codes, I am not going through the codes. Concepts of probability, so we covered the concepts of probability, what is probability, the various terminologies what is mutually exclusive event, dependent event, independent event, joint probability, conditional, conditional probability and to do those things we have contingency table, we have got a base theorem. So all of those things we covered in our last session. I am just going through the slides so that it gets recorded both in the panopto and also re registered in your memory. And then I said there is an application of conditional probability market basket analysis. I hope you got time to go through this slide or probably it will get covered or might have got covered in, in your marketing. Bayes theorem extension of the conditional probability, right? I covered this example of the disease, right? One of the very good example to understand a Bayes theorem, association of attributes, uh, Yule's coefficient of association I had mentioned, okay. Anyone got time to do calculation of Yule's coefficient of association? No. Okay. Distributions I covered, I covered uh, lucky seven example, yes, so that recollects, right, I did that. So probability distributions, binomial. <laughs> Poisson distribution and this is where I had stopped. <laughs> we now get into uh, sampling, okay. Sampling distribution. Why do we do sampling? Because if we have a large number of data points, so we need to basically see out of that I sample something so that I can get uh, the overall feel of that particular data. Yes, so very nicely there. From a large data, I take a very small sample. From sample, I get a feel of the population. 
what I what I mean by feel is I'm making inference about the population. So sampling from a population, we take a sample, and from sample, we inference about the population. Very simple. Okay. And reason why I have to why we take many decisions based on sampling is it's many a times not practical to analyze the whole data. Okay. Now let's understand uh, a term which is called a random variable and here before that objective of sampling is to derive inference from sample about the population. When I take a sample it has to be a random sample. Okay. If it is a biased sample you will not get proper inference about the population. Now let's understand what I mean by random and what I mean by biased. Assume I've got the data and I sort the data by gender and I take 10 percentage of observation from the top. What will happen? Only male or female will come, right? If I've got a high concentration, assume 50, 50 percentage male, female and I just take 10 percentage initial observation assuming data is large. In that case what will happen is only male or only female will come. Now any inference I draw from that, will it make sense? No. So the sample should be random. Only then the inference that you derive of the population will from the uh, only then the inference you derive from sample will be able to relate to the population. Now the question comes, how will a random sample give me inference about the population? Okay. So the, typically what we say is, assume you have taken sufficiently large random sample from population. In that case, the mean of the sample will be very close to the population mean. Assumption is sufficiently large random sample. Now the moment the word random comes up, many people think how will random sample give me a right inference about the population. Now let's rephrase the same statement. You say random in statistics means not biased. So now rephrase the statement. Assume we take a sufficiently large unquote, quote unquote unbiased sample. Random means unbiased sample. Assume we take sufficiently large quote unbiased sample quote close from the population. In that case the mean of the sample will be representative of the population mean. So, so random, random means unbiased. unbiased. Okay. okay. So, there are multiple <coughs> factors to it. So when you say random and you sufficiently large, sufficiently large is actually dependent on the use case. Dependent on the use case and dependent on the population. We will come, come to that in sample size calculation. Sufficiently, sufficiently large is another important, important parameter. How many random samples you want to take? A uh, uh, one random sample is representative of the population provided the random but sample is sufficient. We actually, do like multiple times we take the random sample, like 100 iterations of random right. sample for some use case. Why? Right. Because one random sample may not give you a good result, so probably we will go for multiple iterations. That is called sampling error. We will come to that. And in, uh, in that case, the confusion will get over. Okay. okay. Now let's understand point estimator as population parameter. Mean, when you talk of mean, does it give us one value to you? When you compute mean of a data, does it give a one value? That's why it is called a point estimator. Okay. Range, range is not a point estimate. Okay. <coughs> Two main point estimates of a population are mean and proportion. What is proportion? If I have a variable gender, can I compute mean? No. In that case, the parameter estimate becomes proportion. 
what proportion of observations are male or female, right? So, in that case, the point estimate becomes the proportion. These are the two <coughs> important population parameter estimates, mean, proportion. Mean for a sample is represented by x bar. Notations are important. Notations are important. Why? Because if you know the notations, when you study some literature, some work, for example, you are trying to find a, understand some machine learning algorithm. And in machine learning algorithm, you come across x bar, you will come across x cap, you will come across mu. And what happens is, when we go through those documents, half the time we simply ignore the document because it's lots of maths which is written. Thing is, we don't understand many of those notations. That's why we feel it's too complex. Okay, so notations are important. X bar is used to represent sample mean, mu is used to represent population mean, proportion is represented by p cap and population proportion is represented by pi. Okay. <coughs> the sample mean x bar is considered as unbiased estimator of the population. The sample mean is considered as a unbiased estimator of the population when it's a numeric variable okay why it is called as an unbiased estimator of the population coming to your point if we take many samples from a population and we compute mean of those samples and then we compute mean of mean that mean of mean will be equal to population mean and that is what is central limit theorem. If I take many samples, I compute mean of each sample and then I compute mean of mean. For example, I take 100 samples from population. For each of the 100 samples, I compute mean. I will get how many means? 100 means. Can I now do average of those 100 mean? I can. The mean of those mean will be equal to population mean. This is central limit theorem. Okay. Some people are thinking how it will happen. We will validate with simulation. Okay. Uh, mean is called as a unbiased estimator as opposed, as opposed to an estimate. And this unbiased estimate is called sample statistic, not sample statistics. The unbiased estimator is called the sample statistic. Okay, just, just jargons, but you should know these jargons. Okay. <coughs> but what was E there? E of X bar? What was E? This one expected mean, expected of all the X bars. Okay. Is it because you have know, taking sample and you? Well, I'll come. No, what I'm saying, why is it unbiased estimator? Is called unbiased estimator. Because it's because the sample we are taking is unbiased. These are the only. Yeah, because if you compute the expected of those values, the expected of those values will be equal to population. Okay, that's why it is called an unbiased estimator. It gives you a value which is representing the population value. <coughs> The table here is small x bar. Yeah. And here it is the cap. So is there any difference? No, no, that is uh, not different. Okay. Sampling distribution conceptual framework. The probability distribution of all possible values a sample statistic can take is called sampling distribution. The probability distribution of all possible values. A sample, a sample statistic can take is called the sampling distribution. <coughs> Let's assume what, what this means. In Great Lake, for last two years, probably some 20 batches has happened. Okay. We collect data of all the 
people who participate in this. Assume average batch size is 50. So 20 into 50, 1000 observations. So I've got data of 1000 observations. From this 1000 observations, I take a random sample and of 50 students. That is sample 1, 50 student. And I compute the mean. Say the mean age comes out to be 28. Okay. This is the mean age. Mean age in years. Then I take another sample, S2. Again 50 observations. This time around it may come 30. I keep taking the samples. I repeat it 100 times. This observations, when I plot, basically this is a continuous number. For the timing, let's break it into buckets of rounded years. For the discussion, let's assume we break it into buckets of rounded years. In that case, the plot would come something something like this. Okay, the plot will come something like this. What this graph is trying to say? Overall, if I would have taken the 1000 observation, the mean would have come say 28. But now, when I take a sample, will the mean come exactly 28? No. Will the, sometimes it will come 28 point above or sometimes it will come below. And it can sometimes probably even take a value which is 22, maybe. And there is a very thin chance it may take a value which is 38, thin chance but still there. Okay, If I make a distribution of all the samples, if I take a distribution of all the samples, the probability of I getting a value which is say 27 or I getting a value which is 29 is the probability of out of 100 uh, samples, I would have got more number of times the value which is very close to 27, 28, 29. Definitely the probability around 28 would be the highest. As I go away from this mean, I might probably get 1 out of 100 observations where I got this 22. So it will be 1 percent and I would have got probably 1 out of 100 observation which is 38. If you compute a probability distribution of this continuous number, that is called as the sampling distribution. That is called the sampling distribution. Are you getting? I take samples from the population. I compute mean of the samples and make a distribution plot of those mean value that is called the sampling distribution. Okay. Is that clear? You, 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 you mentioned one point. Yes, sir. That uh, the mean mean of the mean will be the same as the population mean. Right? <coughs> That's what you mentioned. So in this case, say, say the population mean is 28. Right? Yes, sir. In that case, even the mean of the mean will be 28. Right? So yes. Both, both will meet at the same Yes. Mean. So if you, if you draw for the population mean, so this will have the Point at 20 only. So the distribution might differ because this is the mean distribution and that is population distribution. Yes, we are going to prove this point with simulation. Your understanding is right. But, but the distribution will still be different. Right? 
though the mean would be same. Mean of the mean, mean of the sample means. The dis this is the sampling distribution. Is equal to the population. Yes. This is the sampling distribution. Okay. This is called sampling distribution. Everyone, uh, till here, everyone, it's okay. Yes, sir. This is the question that you are asking. Yeah. So one question is that. This will be validated. So you can note down that this will be validated. I'll do through simulation. Next question. Next question is the distribution of the population versus distribution of mean. Okay. Now the second question is, <laughs> what the second question, what he is trying to say is, if I make a distribution of the population, which means I take a distribution of this, the distribution of this data need not be like this. The distribution of this might be This may be the distribution of the population. This, if I make a frequency, uh, make a frequency plot in rounded years, I may get this kind of a graph, which is not a normal distribution kind of thing. Okay, this is called population distribution. Now, irrespective of how is the population distributed? The sampling distribution will always be normal distribution. That is what we are going to prove. That is also what we are going to prove through simulation. Okay? So sampling distribution, we have got mean in the x-axis and uh, the number of samples in the... Y yes, here, it's a, here I have converted it into a, uh, a frequency plot okay. to explain that it will be a normal distribution. Okay? So far clear? Yeah? So number of samples is not y axis. Okay. Y axis is the number of times 20 and okay. the frequency. The frequency. The frequency. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is what I explained. Take many samples from population, compute mean x of each sample, and then plot a distribution of the mean or taken over many samples, and that is called sampling distribution. This is exactly what I have explained here. The three bullet points. Yeah. Sampling error. Now, typically when you do your work, are you going to take 100 samples from population and then on each sample you will build a regression model. In that case, you will end up with 100 regression models. Then the question will be, of the 100 regression models, which regression model should I use in future to predict? Right? So, will we do this kind of thing when we actually go in real life implementation? Logically think and answer? No. We cannot. So, what we are going to do is, we will take one sample, build a model and say the sample is representative of the population. So, this model should hold true on the whole population. But, if I take one sample, my mean was coming here 28 and say that mean of that sample comes out to be 23 and I have built regression model on that. In that case, model may not hold true for the population. This gap is called sampling error. We will solve one by one. This gap is called sampling error. I take one sample. Practically, you all agree that we cannot take hundreds of samples, build hundreds of models, and then again we lead to that confusion of the hundred which equation to take. 
So practically, it's very clear. We have to take one sample, build model on that sample, and use that equation for future purpose. There is no two opinion on this. Agreed. <coughs> so if I take one sample and my value comes 23, the difference between 23 to 28 will be called as sampling error. Now the question is, am I willing to tolerate this much of sampling error? If no, then what is the answer? If no, the answer to that is increase the sample size. Probably with 50, I may get more dispersion in my sampling distribution graph. With 50, I may get more dispersion, more range. Probably I increase it to 100 in that case, the graph will become slightly narrower. Okay. In that case, my chance of sampling error will also reduce by increasing the sample size. How to compute sample size will come to later. But concept is clear. The concept is clear, but my statement. Unbiased, right? Yes. Unbiased. So sample is unbiased. So as per your explanation, it's still biased. Because you take one sample, it came as 23, right? Hmm. And that is you are still not making that is not a problem. Problem. Wait, wait, wait. Wait. What, what is biased and what is unbiased? Yes. What, what is biased? And what is the unbiased? Let's try to understand these two terms. If I take a sample through some systematic process, it is biased. What is the systematic process? I sort the data. Having sorted the data, I pick top thousand records. Which means I have not allowed the records to be chosen by themselves, which means I have put my bias. That is called bias. If I in no way have tried to influence, <clears throat> if I in no way have tried to influence the selection of a record, that is called unbiased. Biased and unbiased does not relate to sampling error. But definitely when biased is there, sampling error will be higher. That is for sure. But when unbiased is there and in a given sample you get a higher sampling error, that is because of the distribution, probability distribution. There is a, always a chance that a sample may be far off from your actual mean. There is always a chance. But the chance of that happening when you take an unbiased, which means random, that chance will be probably 0 0.01 percentage, which is 0 0.001 0 .001 in proportion terms. Okay? Yeah? Make sense? So, I hope what you got the sampling error. Sampling error is I take a sample the mean of that sample, how far it is from the population mean, that is called sampling error. So, we all need to be cognizant of the fact when we take one sample, the value of that sample will not be exactly the population parameter estimate. There will be some gap. Now, how much gap you are willing to tolerate is question. How do we eliminate or reduce that gap is another question. If my tolerance of error is not high, which means my sample size should be large. If I have 1000 records, I take a sample having 1000 records, what will be my sampling error? Zero. Which means you virtually move, you want zero sampling error, take the whole population. But again, the fact of life is you cannot do anything and everything on the whole population. That's why you will have to live with error. That's where probability, chances, likelihood of being wrong will come into 
picture. Yeah. <coughs> now let's prove the central limit theorem. I median is not a point. Uh, median is a point estimator. Medium is a point estimator, but median is not considered as a unbiased estimator. Median is a point estimator, but it's not a unbiased. So, what is usually an accepted tolerance range? Like here, it is coming as five in this example. So that is definitely not. That is problem to problem statement. statement. But usually, as a thumb, like it does, it have to be always less than or close. There to is something called as confidence, confidence interval. interval. So I want 95% confident interval. That's what is typical. Okay. Again, how much error you want to have, fluctuations you want. Again, it's subject matter. For example, uh, you you design a how many from mechanical industry? One. Well, mechanical. Mechanical engineering. How many of you done? So something there, there was in a mechanical engineering, there's something taught was again probably it's common in first year of engineering. Okay. Some some examples, sorry for people who from commerce or arts background, some examples will come from science background because it becomes very easy to relate. And typically first year is common to all. So it is taught that I am drilling a hole. Okay. So there is a, probably a plate and second component has to fix on it which means all the holes on the second component and the first component where you want to nut bolt it, they has to match. But will it be 100% match? No. Okay. So typically what you do is the underlying plate, you do not make it round, you make it like this shape. Do you agree? Why? Because even that problem is there, it will manage. Okay, but now the, the nut has to go into it. No, that problem you solved. But now if the nut is too loose, in that case, problem. So what happens is the and other component which has to come on top of that, the hole is too big, then what will happen? So what happens, there is something called tolerance. We all learned tolerance, right? Tolerance used to be given, okay, I want a nut of something two size plus or minus 0.0. Five, something like this is you should be given. You are you we all came across the word tolerance in engineering. How many recollect? Right? Ye acceptable hai. Kyun agar in that problem, what happens is this is the allowed fixtures will fit. There will be no problem. Again, that's that's the error. This is the error, right? So, depending upon the application, you have to see. Yeah, but these are some things, these are many of these concepts were actually taught to us way back. Yeah. So, we will have to see case by case basis. What is the acceptable limit? Yeah. So, let us come to the central limit theorem. Central limit theorem states that irrespective of the shape of the distribution of original population. We just covered this, this graph, irrespective of the shape of the original population. The sampling distribution of the mean will approach a normal distribution. This is the sampling distribution of the mean. Why it is called sampling distribution of the mean? Because we took sample, we computed mean and then took the distribution of that mean, that's why it is called sampling distribution of the mean, will approach a normal distribution, which is the graph which I showed like this, a normal bell shape, as the size of the sample increases and becomes large, okay. The last point as the size of sample increases and becomes large. What if I take samples which are just 5 observations and not 50 observations? And then I take 5 observations and compute mean and then make a plot. This graph probably you may not expect because sample size are 
small okay so that's what the point is saying as the size of sample increases and becomes large so sample size has to be large sufficient sufficient okay and what is large number law of large numbers 30 observations or more is considered large but that is thumb rule but not in all cases 30 observations will be considered large yeah <coughs> and this discovery this famous discovery has been made by Linderberg Levy and it is a milestone discovery why because based on this central limit theorem the entire statistics entire statistics of sampling that what we do is everything we do sampling and we take inference about the population it is completely based on this central limit theorem landmark discovery by Linderberg Levy. okay now I am going to prove with simulation point by point what this central limit theorem is trying to say <coughs> Law of large numbers and central limit theorem together, these are the three important points which we are going to cover using this entire simulation codes. Okay, so all of those things will be covered. The first point based on law of large number and central limit theorem is mean of a sampling distribution, that is, mean of the sample mean will be equal to population mean provided you have sufficiently large number of trials. Sampling distribution of the mean approaches a normal distribution. This is the second point. That the sampling distribution will be a normal distribution. And the third point which I have not yet spoken of is variance of the sampling distribution. <coughs> there is a variance in this, right? There is a dispersion, right? If there is a dispersion, there is a variance. So, variance of the sampling distribution will be equal to Variance of the population divided by n. This variance will be equal to what variance I get here. Divide it by n. And here we took was 50. In this case 50. If I compute this, this will be the variance of this distribution. Okay. okay. So, you have given a thumb rule for the, the number of samples, right? So it is that is the law of large numbers is that 30, 30 is. Is there, is there a thumb rule for the number of This is what thumb, 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 thumb rule. Number of, uh, I, uh, one sample, how many should be there? So, you could find. Uh, uh, each sample should be 30, 30 or more. Okay. Or each sample, each sample, sample should be. But, but once you decide, decide N, all samples, samples have to be have the same. N. Yeah, got it. So, how many samples is there any rule for that? When you are going to build a model, how many samples are you going to build, use to build a model? I will take one. I know that. Why? Because I am not going to build 100 models. Okay. So, how many trials should be there? That is in real life is not important. Because in real life, when we are going to build a model from a population by taking a sample, we are not going to take many trials. Okay. But to prove the theory, he is saying sufficiently large number of trials. That large can be 100 or 500 or 1000. Or you can take it 10,000 also. Okay. Because the entire objective is to prove this theory. Okay. From a practical standpoint, Number of trials is not important for us. Why number of trials is not important for us from a practical standpoint? Because we are going to take one sample and build a model. From a practical standpoint, what is important question for us? In that sample, how many observations should be there? In that sample, how many observations should be there? Uh, how close or how close it should be to the population estimate? And depending upon how close it should be to the population estimate, my n will be determined. Right? Okay. Central limit theorem, I don't think so. I have put it in a Python notebook. So, I will use Spider and I will ask you people also to use 
spider okay and if you are not comfortable with spider what you can do is copy paste in ipython notebook yeah just open the file i'll wait for you to open the file and i would like all of you to execute the code believe me this thing was taught to us during school and college days but unfortunately at that time our professors did not have computers as such they could not simulate this because we have the power of computers today what linderberg levy discovered long back probably 50 60 years back or more i don't know what he discovered using whatever sophistication of technology was available it's a it's a huge admiration that they could do without power of computers okay so today what we are going to do is simulate and find it out so i would request all of you to run it and believe me ye this would not be taught with that much clarity anywhere okay all of you have the file open yeah <coughs> so first thing we require three packages i am just going to import those packages my data file is in e drive there is a income expense data file which i have already shared so having set my working directory i am going to import that data file i am not going to run the head command because it does not show data nicely so i'm just going to double click and open the data to be seen all of you i hope you have been able to import the file so what i have given is a sample data from survey okay 50 observations of household survey where we asked the household what is their monthly household income what is their monthly household expense how many family members are there are they staying on a rent or emi are they paying what is the highest qualified member in the family how many earning members are there in the family these are some basic details details that we have captured okay and number of observations are only 50 so 0 from 249 which means 50 because the index starts with zero so we can keep moving down because all of these things are not required where we'll go somewhere i would have put a comment central limit theorem somewhere around line number 120 i have put a comment okay the other way is i think so that would be much better all of you put the laptop flap sit down theek hai na first i'll run the code so the your focus will be on the screen and then you all ensure you run the code because it will validate with 50 30 people here also that when you run on your laptops and each of you say okay i got the same number it will be a further validation right nahi to abhi kya ho raha focus aadha aadha move ho raha hai sample data set i am creating a empty data frame okay now here i have got a loop what is this loop doing for i in a range of 1 to 1001 which mean 1000 times this loop is going to execute okay 1001 will be excluded i am taking a random sample of size 30 so 1000 iterations i'll run each iteration i'll take 30 random observations from population of 50 observations and that will become my sample and then i'll keep app appending them one below other which means after the loop has executed 
I will have 1000 into 30, that is 30,000 observations. Yes? So, I am running this loop. Replace is equal to 2. Yes, sir. All the iteration. Yeah. So, replace was set to 2. Every time you pick the 30 test samples. See, I got only 50 observations. So, yeah. But usually, when you take samples, all replace will always be true. If I'm taking only having 50 observations, when I do sampling, one sample is, second sample is independent of the first, third is independent of the second. So I've taken like that. Second sample can have some. Obviously, from the, so 50, from we are converting to 30,000 observations. 50, from 50, I'm taking a sample of 30. Then again, from 50, I'm taking a sample of 30. Then again 50, I take a sample of 30. So 30, 30, 30, I have taken 1000 times. So how many samples I have got? 1000. Each sample has got how many? 30. So 1000 into 30, 30,000. So I have got a data set having 30,000 records. Okay. So I have got that data set ready. So this is what my data set looks like. <coughs> See here is sample number. Okay. See sample number. Then sample number 2. Sample number 3, 4 and each sample has got 30 observations. The sample number is to indicate they are part, the observations are part of which sample. It this kind of repeated values right in every sample. Sir, obviously, 50 yeah, observations and with this kind of so 30, right? Now, I am running a group by. At a sample number level, I am grouping 5 numeric columns. I took only the numeric columns huh? because the non-numeric like highest qualification cannot be done. For that you have to go into proportions. So this part of the code is going to do the group by done. So how many records here I will have? 1000 observations. Now for each of the numeric variable at a sample number level I have got the mean of the income, mean of the expense, mean of the family members, mean of mean basically. I got mean of, sorry, I still I got mean. I got mean, not mean of mean because they are at a sample level. Now I have done mean of mean. I will explain what has happened. This was my data set. At, for, at sample level, I have got mean. Then I am taking all these 1000 observation again computing the mean. So that becomes my mean of mean. For expense I again compute mean of mean, right. So I will have only 5 variables, right. Why? Why I will have only 5? Because these are only 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 numeric columns which I took, right. I am just resetting the index and giving sample variable as mean name. So the data set looks slightly better. That is what I have done. Now at a population level, for the entire population I am computing the mean. There are 50 observations. So directly I am computing the mean for the entire data. And I am resetting index and then I am giving the names as p var variable and p mean. Okay. So these three lines of code I execute. So these are population variable names and at a population variable level I got the mean. I am now concatenating the sample mean data set, this data set I am concatenating with the population mean data set. Having concatenated I have got sample mean I am dividing it by population mean. This number should come to what? 1. This should come to 1. Why? That is the ideal case. Because what we are saying is mean of mean is equal to population mean. So this should come to 1. Okay. So I got a new data set SP mean, sample population mean. And I will remove all of these colors. So here you see this is sample variable name, this is the population variable name. This is this number, this is this number and ratio. The objective of keeping both the columns is to ensure that I have merged the columns properly. Right? Can you see the ratio 0 0.996, 0 0.995, 0 0.998, 0 0.999, 0 0.999, 0 0.999, 0 0.999, 0 0.999, 0 0.999, 0 0.999, 0 0.999, 0 0.999, 0 0.999, 
0.996, all of the ratios are closer to 1. The first point of central limit theorem is very conclusively proved with the sample, uh, sampling simulation mean of the sample distribution that is mean of the mean will approach population mean with large number of trials. How many trials we did? Thousand. So was my sample size sufficient? Thumb rule is 30. Okay, thumb rule is 30. Sufficient sample size. Now just before I get into this 30, any more questions comes up, I'll tell you one more thing. This is a thumb rule. If tomorrow you have got a data set where you have got gender, male, female, okay? Then you will say, I'll take only 30 observations. Probably it might not fly. Why? Because now, if you take 30 observations, probably 15 will go to male and 15 will go to female. At that level, now you compute means at this gender level, are the samples large? No. In that case, you should have 60. In that case, you should have 60. If I would have experimented this thing by doing simulation, I could have computed this mean at occupation level also. I could have simulated this. We had this variable, right? At the qualification level, I would have computed the mean, but I have only 50 observations and there are 5 occupation uh, qualification categories. I have got 5, 5, 5 samples. In that case, this would not hold. So if you have got say 5 categories, in that case number of observations should be 150, 5 into 3. If you have gender also, in that case 5 into 30 into 2, 5 into 2 into 30, because 2 categories of gender, 5 categories of occupation, 10 into 30. So 300 observations should be there. So as more categorical variables comes, that's how one thumb rule of arriving at population that you require for building the model. Distinct number of categories you have, you have to keep multiplying them and that's the number of observations you require and multiply 30. Because for that combination, you require 30 observations. Yeah. So, all of you now run along with me till the data import part all of you had done right this line of code you people have to run for loop can you please repeat the categorical value size see, in this example see as you have got more and more data points mm -hmm. assume you have got a categorical variable how yeah. in that category you have got five categories mm -hmm. so when you are taking a sample if you want the population estimate and the mean sample estimate should be very close to each other. So for that categories, into 30 you have to take the observations. So in this case it's 150, so you are taking a sample size of 150, is that what you are No, we don't have population only. That's why I did not do the calculation at qualification level. I did not do the calculation at, uh, I did the calculation only at the population and sample. If you want the calculation to match at category level also, it will match. But what I am saying in that case, each category you should have sufficient observation. So in this case, the data socket is not. Yes. Yeah. No, in this case, that's why I did not go at qualification level. No? Mm -hmm. I did not do any analysis at qualification. Mm -hmm. I took the portfolio as the benchmark. Right. So it's not possible to do in this data set. In this data set. Okay. All of you did the looping, for looping. Yeah. Having done the for loop. You have to compute this mean, rearrange the column, ignore that. This three lines, if this is not commented, comment it. Have you computed sample mean? Yes, last row, diagonally opposite to me, yes. Then you have to compute the mean of mean, these three lines, 141 to 143. Having computed the sample mean, you have to compute the population mean. And having computed the population mean, you have to concatenate the sample mean, population mean, and then open the data set SP mean and see what is the ratio coming. 
yeah so anyone getting a ratio which is way off from 1 so how many simulations we are now running in the class 2 to 4 6 7 8 10 12 15 17 18 20 22 24 25 simulations we are running in class and one i did 26 so all of you are getting this number close to 1 beyond doubt it is proven mean of mean is equal to population mean provided sample is sufficiently large and you take sufficiently large number of trials. Now someone will say sir I take only 5 trials and then you prove not possible, right? In real case scenario, if I have like 40,000 data sets, let's say 40,000 objects inside. Then you will take 30 and then say, okay, mean or mean, it will not hold up. No, no, what I'm telling you, <laughs> just like uh, while the entering the machine number of bar, let's say I have an observation which I have like 40,000, sorry, I have a data set which I have uh, 40,000 mm -hmm. observations. In that, uh, if I will take, uh, let's say, 25,000 uh, for the sample and uh, uh, other for the test, then it will work. What? The same. What? What? But in that case, we don't have to multiply 1,000 and all those. Yeah. Because it's a bigger Big. data set. Let's move to the second point. The sampling distribution of the mean approaches a normal distribution. This one is done. Done. I have used a Seaborn package to make a plot. Okay. So let's move to that piece of code. I am moving to line number 231, somewhere around there. Uh, the middle code I'll run later, but let's move to line 231 to prove the second point. Irrespective of the population distribution, the sampling distribution is a normal distribution. So I am using a Seaborn package, I will import that package and then only two lines of code. First I am doing a, distri a distribution plot of the actual variable from the population. Then I am doing a distribution plot from the particular one variable, I have taken expense in this case. And then I am from the sampling mean dish data, I am taking expense again. Okay. So let me make this plot first. Control enter. This is the plot of the expense data. <coughs> and if I make a plot of expense mean from the sampling data, this is the column name. This is the column name. I did not uh, rename them to mean and all of those things. See the distribution, you can see the two distribution you compare, this is a very much normal distribution kind of a plot and this one is any distribution, right? So even this thing validated, there are other plots also uh, where I am not trying to show using a line basically. So let's run this other plots also. This monthly household expense and bottom also I have to rename it. Yeah. Okay. This is a density plot. Density kind of a plot. And if I see a density plot here a perfect bell curve kind of a structure. Right? You need not just try with expense. You may think certainly Sir would have already tried with the expense. So he's showing only the expense graph. I should not try with the expense. I want to try with income. Change it income. I want to make annual income. Make it annual income. You want family members. Make it family members. Okay. Try any other variable. Again, proven beyond doubt with 25 simulations along with me that irrespective of the population distribution, Sampling distribution is a, okay, all of you here also, okay. Now the third point is sample variance is equal to population variance divided by n, where n is the sample size. What it means is this bell curve has variance, right, this has got variance. So, this bell curve variance is equal to 
variance of this divided by n, where n is the sample size. Okay, so for that the code is above. Some codes is not very cleaned up, so you will have to bear with me. This is sample mean. Okay, I am taking the sample mean data and I am taking I lock one line number 165. We can just run line number 165. For all the variables, we are computing the variance. For all the variables, we are computing the variance. So, I just run this control enter. So, here I have got the variance of from the sample data. Okay. Then I can run line number 168, where from the overall population, I am getting the variance of the actual population data. These are two values which I have got. What I will do is I will copy paste this because I have not written the code it in. No, probably. Okay, let us do some coding. No? S where or you can also learn Python, I will also learn Python. <coughs> P where. Okay, we will just do this. We will capture this data into <coughs> we got S where and P where. Both of them are coming as series. Why they are coming as series? So dot dot transform t right this command is right series object is not callable or probably p pd dot data frame Yeah, this is an R, then it should be dot data frame something. Dot two frame, okay. I am just trying to have it in a okay. Now I got the data frame, yeah, because otherwise I would not be able to merge them because it will be series. I am slightly more expert at R. Okay, I got S wire and P wire as my data frames, and then I have to concatenate them. And it says that we should do reset index also. So let's do reset index also. Dot reset underscore because otherwise the column names becomes index names. A is equal to true. Yeah, this is bugged. So, we got these two and then we just do concatenation this code. I hope all of you are able to do with me. Sometimes some confusion is also ok. It helps you learn sp where pd dot concatenate and p where That's important, right? SP where? Where is my SP where? Yeah. So here I've got the all column names have gone here. Copy. That's the easiest thing instead of all of these Python hassles. Text to column. Uh, delimited. <sighs> next. Finish. Uh, no. The data text to column delimited next space finish 
this is the number I got from sample. This is the number I got from population. I'll just paste adjacent to each other. Microsoft is intelligent. It has automatically done text to column this time. This I have to do divide by 50, right? Wait, no, 30. Sample size was 30, no? 30. So total size was 50, but the formula is sampling distribution is equal to population distribution, uh, sampling variance is equal to population variance divided by n, where n is not the population size, where n is the sample size. So divide by 30. And we need to take a ratio of this number with that number. This number divided by this number, I have to do formatting. Can you once again see these numbers are coming very close to 1. This is the point I am trying to prove. I will just for brevity and clarity do some formatting. Home, merge, sampling variance cut this control v delete this and copy this population variance and this is p var divided by n and this is S where divided by P where divided by N, right? So this ratio is coming closer to 1. This is the third point of central limit theorem. You take the variance of the sampling distribution, you take the variance of the population distribution, population variance divided by N, where N is the sample size this number will be equal to the sampling variance for five variables we are getting the value which is very close to one okay so three theorems three important points of central limit theorem with simulation is proven close to one again depends on the number of samples if the sample size is, the number of samples are large, then mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 That is the assumption. Underlying assumption is sample size are large, sufficient number of trials. Yeah. What is the benefit of doing all of this? What is the benefit of the central limit theorem? The benefit of the central limit theorem is once I know that central limit theorem is a proven fact. It's a proven fact. I have got a population on which I have to do some statistics. I take a sample. And that sample mean comes out to be somewhere here, say 25. I can compute the Variance of this, knowing the population variance, I can compute the variance of this. If I do not know population variance, can I compute the sample variance? I have got the sample, I can compute sample variance directly. Right? That is easy because going to population variance would be difficult. If I know sample variance, can I reverse compute population variance? Yeah. So there is a relation which is a proven relationship. Yeah. So using a sample variance, I can reverse compute the population variance. That is point one. Having known sample variance, what I can do is I can now apply the empirical rule empirical rule is mean plus or minus one standard 
variance one standard deviation not variance one standard deviation will capture 68 percentage of data 68 percentage mean plus or minus one standard deviation will capture 68 percentage of the values what does this mean what is this what is the meaning of this can i rub this part this kind of a confidence interval this is a confidence interval this 28 is actual mean this 28 is actual mean i have taken a sample and the value of that has come 25 okay and from that sample i have also computed the variance i know sample variance if i know sample variance i know sample standard deviation do you agree now the empirical rule is whatever value you have got mean plus or minus one standard deviation captures 68 percentage of potential values mean plus or minus two standard deviation captures 95 percentage mean plus or minus three standard deviation captures 99 percentage so at a 95 percent confidence interval if i want to say what will be the range of population mean this is the sample mean in real life you may not know this number in real life you may not know this number because the population itself will be large so that you don't have time and effort to compute this so what you will do is you will take a sample once you have got the sample you got the sample standard deviation you say plus or minus two standard deviation it will give you a range this value plus or minus two standard deviation will give you a value and this will be the minimum this will be the maximum you can say at 95 percent confidence i can say the population mean will be in this min max range right at a 95 percentage you can give the answer at that confidence if you want 99 percent confidence then you take three standard deviation okay uh, coming back to this empirical thing this empirical thing what it says that if i take plus or minus one standard deviation my value will be in this range plus or minus two standard deviation plus or minus three standard deviation because it is proven all these mathematics is proven with simulation proven Linderberg proved it 50 years back today we are proving it again with simulation okay so what it means is i take a sample i get this value plus or minus three standard deviation at 99 percent confidence i want to know but now when i do plus or minus three standard deviation at 99 percent confidence the values comes out to be say 22 to 28 then someone says hey 22 to 28 is the range i don't like the range i want plus or minus three standard deviation should come 24 to 26 what are you saying what you're saying is i want three standard deviation error should be plus or minus one value only do reverse computation now because you know three sd is equal to now plus or minus one what is sd standard deviation but how does sd came population divided by n because the standard deviation is of the sample the standard deviation of the sample is called standard error this is the error okay so i i want only plus or minus one reverse compute you know this reverse compute if you don't know this you can reverse compute and make an estimate of this 
After making estimate, you reverse compute this. 3 HD is equal to this value, you get the N. Okay. So all those reverse computation is possible when you don't want wider range. I hope that's clear. We'll come to that's what I'm now coming and explaining through this. Okay. There is an empirical rule for a normal distribution. The empirical rule for a normal distribution is when you have this kind of a normal distribution, what is a normal distribution? Let's just cover that slide for once. What is a normal distribution? A bell shaped curve. First point. In a normal distribution, mean, median, mode. They all overlap. If you cut the data at this mean, it will be symmetrical. 50 percentage of data point is here and 50 percentage of your data point will be here because mean, median, mode are same. Median is 50th percentile. So, 50 percent proportion left side, 50 proportion right hand side. Okay. <coughs> Second, the one of the most important point is in a normal distribution, this tails are asymptotic. What it means is this part will go on for ever like it will be parallel infinity. This part will go on to infinity. This tail will never touch the x axis theoretically. And when two lines are parallel to each other, coming closer and closer to each other, but theoretically never touching, it is called asymptote. So the tails are asymptotic in a normal distribution. And the total area in this is 1. When you make a plot, the area is assumed to be 1. It is assume means it is equal to 1 because that area is to assume to represent population. Okay. And total population will be 1, 100 percent. Okay. So, the area is converted into a probability distribution graph. This is a normal distribution graph and the area representing the probability. Okay. This is a normal distribution. Now, what this normal distribution has the empirical rule, the <coughs> empirical rule of normal distribution is if I take mean plus or minus one standard deviation, it will capture 68 percentage of the data points. If I have mean plus or minus two standard deviation, it will capture 95 percentage of the data points. If I do mean plus or minus three standard deviation, it will capture 99 percentage of the data points. Okay. So, let us prove this empirical rule also through simulation. Somewhere here, uh, line 258 validating empirical rule between mean and standard deviation for a normally distributed data. We are going to use sample mean. We are not going to use population mean data. Why? We are not going to use population data. We are going to use the sample, thousand observations, thousand samples which I created. I am going to use that, not the population. Why? Because that is the one which is normal distribution. The population we saw was not a normal distribution. And this empirical rule is for normal distribution. Okay. So, here this number, names mean we did not rename it at top. So, we will have to copy the name monthly HHX expense. I will take monthly HHX expense. This one. We have to rename huh? monthly HHX expense. So, I am computing two important parameters. One is the mean and standard deviation for the expense variable. I have computed mean and standard deviation for the expense variable and I have captured them in income mean and 
income standard deviation variable here income word is actually expense now because we have used expense variable okay so i have computed the monthly income mean and monthly income standard deviation yes now what it is saying the distribution is normal which is proven mean plus or minus one standard deviation should have 68 percentage of data point so what i am doing is from those observations i am doing i am written a function of offset okay i have written a function to do offset and capture the data so here what this function is doing is it is just doing mean minus standard deviation multiply how many uh, multiply the number of standard deviation so I here I am saying 1 so it will become 1 standard deviation then if I will pass 2 then it will become 2 standard deviation then I am passing 3 then it will be 3 standard deviation so I am taking 3 subsets plus or minus 1 standard deviation plus or minus 2 standard deviation plus or minus 3 standard deviation so this entire piece of code one is a function and then plus or minus 1 2 3 3 calls okay okay this variable also has okay now one standard deviation subset should have what percentage of observations 68 so let us see what is our total count total count is 1000 observations total count is 1000 observation one standard deviation is how many observation 692 is that coming 692 for you people it may come 68 67 68 point something 693, 692, any other numbers? 683. What I can once again do is if all 25 people have computed, I can take the value and do average. It will come around 68. It will come around 68. <coughs> Plus or minus one standard deviation empirically proven, right? Let's do second one. Ninety-five point six, and what I said, ninety-five percent two standard deviation. Actually, the two standard deviation is actually one point nine six standard deviation. We round it off and say. But typically, this two standard deviation captures 95 percentage is actually 1.96, not 2. But we speak in rounded terms. It is coming 95.6, 956, 958 something. And let's take three standard deviation. It is coming 99.7. <coughs> so what? Once again, empirically proven fact that from mean plus or minus one standard deviation if it is a normal distribution it will have 68 percentage of the possible values of the overall data from mean plus or minus two standard deviation it will have 95 percent and from mean plus or minus three it will have 99 percentage of the possible values right <coughs> This characteristics, the beauty of this distribution is irrespective of the shape of the normal distribution, irrespective of the, not the shape, irrespective of the mean and standard deviation of the normally distributed curve. What it is trying to say is, I have got this distribution where you see mean is 130 and here mean is 160. But graph wise you see standard deviation is same right here mean is same here mean is 100 but graph wise you see one is more dispersed the dotted is less dispersed what the normal distribution is trying to say is irrespective of the mean value and the standard deviation if it is a normally distributed curve 
bell curve the empirical rule holds there is another significant beauty of the central limit theorem and normal distribution yeah <coughs> and this again can be validated i did it for monthly income you may say sir in between road expense then he went into a fear mode he is tested with income that's why he said everyone okay make expense income no you can try it again with the five variables you can do this entire simulation with any data set that you have any data set that you have you have the entire code now you just have to name rename the data set the column name you can run the simulation you will be be shocked or you will be astonished to see it holds okay <coughs> yeah yeah standard normal distribution now this normal distribution curve that we have got you may have this normal distribution graph for a data which is measured in say currency rupees then you may have this thing for something which is measured in kgs then you will have this thing something which is measured in say liters so each time you have got this distribution curve you may have a, a the normal distribution rule will hold but what will happen is if you have to standardize this entire thing and put it in some table tabular format in that case what will happen is you will have to create a standardized table one is for rupees you will have to create a standardized normal distribution table that plus or minus this thing for, for say kgs then you will have to create it for liters then you will have to create for centimeters to avoid all of this because it becomes unit specific there is something called as standardized normal distribution there is something called standardized normal distribution which is called the z transformation what is z transformation in a z transformation what you do is you <coughs> do z is equal to x minus mu divided by standard deviation the moment you do x minus mu divided by standard deviation the mean of the standardized data becomes zero let me explain this i got the student's data student 1 2000 age 22 25 28 31 35 36 and so forth i am now converting all of this age say age minus mean if i do age minus mean and get the values our mean was 28 we assume in our discussion mean as 28 so this will become minus 6 this will become minus 3 this will become 0 this will become 3 this is 35 so this will become 7 this is 36 this will become 8 and so forth if you compute mean of this value what will be the mean 0 right so one of the thing that what you are doing is x minus mu the moment you do x minus mu in this calculation mean is now taken care mean is taken care but standard deviation is still the same we have standard deviation what is the standard deviation formula what is the standard deviation formula x minus x bar if it is for sample the whole square divided by n minus 1 square root <coughs> so when you do x minus x bar you are seeing the difference from the mean you have done the difference from the mean now you are taking you are computing standard deviation of this for this column what is the mean zero so now if you are computing standard deviation of this you will have to say minus 6 minus 0 it will remain minus 6 only minus 3 minus 0 it will remain so in that case the standard deviation will continue to remain the same but now what i have done is i have divided this term by standard deviation also 
I have divided this by standard deviation also. So what will happen? The standard deviation of this z transformed value. What will be the standard deviation? One. Because you are now dividing this also. So standard deviation will become now one. So this is called z transformation. This is called standardization. This is called standardization. In standardization, you do a z transformation and z transformation is basically scale transformation and the, the z value becomes x minus mu divided by standard deviation for a z transformed variable <coughs> mean is equal to 0 standard deviation is equal to 1 unit is equal to no unit why rupees minus rupees standard deviation is rupees rupee minus rupees rupee 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 divide cancel centimeter minus centimeter divided by centimeter centimeter gone kg minus kg divided by kg kg gone so by doing a z transformation you make mean zero standard deviation one you make mean zero standard deviation one and the scaled variable becomes unit free. Now because it is unit free, you can have a standardized normal distribution table which will work across data which is of any unit. Only thing is that variable you have to convert into a z variable and then see the standardized normal distribution table. The standardized normal distribution table is basically a table which based on a which will have a scale 0, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, plus 1, plus 2, plus 3 like this which will have a normal distribution kind of a graph and now when we apply this for any calculations by seeing the value you can say this much area is captured or this much area is to be considered and then you can directly estimate what percentage of population would be covered or not covered are you getting one problem will solve so you understand this better yeah <coughs> a radar unit is placed to measure speed of cars on Mumbai Pune highway. The speed data is normally distributed. So the mean is 70 and a standard deviation of 10 kilometer. Both of them have got unit. Huh? What is the probability that a car picked at random is traveling at more than 100 km per hour? What is the probability that a car picked at random is traveling at more than 100 km per hour? The first important point it is say the speed is normally distributed. Speed is normally distributed means the graph is something like this, right? Mean is 70. A car picked at random, what is the probability that a car picked at, what is the probability of a car picked at a random is having a speed more than 100 kilometer. Where will 100 kilometer come on this x axis? Right hand side. So 100 will be somewhere here. From the graph, this area under the graph is overall 1. Because the entire distribution, this is the area representing the whole population. So that area has to be 1. Probability it is traveling above 100. Which area is of interest to me? This area is of interest. 
I need to know how many cars are sitting here. They are driving at this pace, right? First is I need to compute the Z. Z is equal to X minus mu divided by standard deviation. What is X here? It is 100. 100 minus 70 divided by 10. It is equal to 3. But now how do I know what probability value to assign? So open your statistics books. Statistics book. There is something page number 561. Cumulative standardized normal distribution. Entry represents area under the cumulative standardized normal distribution from minus infinity to Z. What it means is this table the entries are going to represent values which are computed from minus infinity to Z. For me, <coughs> what is Z? Z has come out for me as 3. So this 100 now get me Z is equal to 3. Where is minus infinity? Minus infinity is on this side. What the table uh, hint says is uh, entry represents area under the cumulative standardized normal distribution from minus infinity to Z. Which means if I now take these parameters Z is equal to 3 on this table then it will represent a value which is this area. It is going to give me this value. So let me go and search. So here it has not given me plus 3. Yeah. It has not given me plus 3. So what I will do? I will see minus 3. Right? So minus 3. Minus 3 is coming out to be 0 0.00135. In this table, if you see, minus 3, on top there is 0 0.00, 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.0. This is what it is trying to say. Minus 3 I take from here. And then add this 0 0.00, 0 0.01. So if I want minus 3.01, in that case, minus 3 from here and 0 0.0 from here, intersection of that in this table is what I have to read. If it would have come, this value would have come not 3, it would have come out to be 3.5. Then I would have to say minus 3 and then 0 0.05 intersection that number. So here minus 3 is reading as 0 0.00135, <coughs> which means it is giving me a number which is only this much part. Because it is minus infinity to minus 3. What is the number? Let me write it down. 0 0.00135. Okay, if minus infinity to minus 3 is this one, then plus 3 to plus infinity will be what? The same number, no? Because it is normal distribution. So what is the probability that a car picked at random is driving at a speed more than 100 kilometer? <coughs> this is the probability. <coughs> no, 0 0.99, we want, our question is, uh, we want the opposite. We want the opposite. What do you, uh, they are taking the plus 3. There is a, if this table, which you have got here, would have been extended from 0 to plus 3 also, but it is not. In that case, it would have given a cumulative value from minus infinity to plus 3 and that cumulative value is would be 0.99 something because you can clearly see this area is too big. This part area is 50%. Definitely it has to be a number more than 50% age. Right? Just by looking at it, we can tell it is 99% of the values will be... Because plus or minus 3 standard deviation, plus or minus 3 standard deviation, logically if we go with our plus or minus 3 standard deviation, plus or minus 3 standard deviation captures how much? 99.7% age. So, point, 
three percentage is not captured, but 0.3 represent this side and this side. But I want only this side, so I have to divide 0.3 by two. So logically, it would be 0.15 percentage. That is 0.15 percentage of the vehicles might be driving at a speed greater than 100 kilometer. <coughs> Yeah, because it's a normal distribution and I'm my interest is right hand side. Okay, the first one I have done. And uh, my friend has already got because many of you have don't have not bought this book. My friend has from internet got the ztable.com. So that website is giving you the normal distribution. Solve the second one. What percentage of cars would be traveling at a speed less than 80 kilometer? Those who have done the second one now answer the third one. What is the probability that a car speed is between 80 kilometer and 100 kilometer? A car picked at random, what is the probability that the car would be between 80 and 100? I'm going back to the first problem. Those who have not understood, just focus. Those who have not understood the first problem, focus. Those who have understood can continue with the third problem. X-axis. X-axis here is our speed, right? Mean is 70. And first question is, how many cars are traveling at a speed more than 100? So, 100 is somewhere here. Okay. What is the question? How many cars are traveling at a speed above 100? Which means my area of interest is this. Now you are seeing a Z distribution table. What is the Z distribution table is saying? That the values I am providing to you. Please hear my what I am saying. The Z distribution is saying the values I am providing to you are from minus infinity to the value that you have got for Z. What is the value of Z we got? 3. So that this 3 is coming for corresponding to 100, I got the Z of 3. So in the table I went and saw the corresponding value for 3, it is coming out what? 0.9987. The value is coming out 0.9987. This 0.9987 is for which area? This area. It is for this area. This area I am extending up to this point. Are you getting? Total area under the curve is how much? One. Total area under the curve is one. But the area that the table has given you is for this. But which area is of your interest? This. So what will be this value? 1 minus 0.9987. So 10 minus 7, 3, 9, 8, 1, 9, 9, 0, 9, 9, 0. Got it? This is how we got this. Done. What is the answer of third question coming? 15.7. Now the third question, the question is uh, easy and tricky also. It's very easy actually, but tricky slightly. What I'm saying is I want greater than 80. So this is 80 and less than 100. So I want this area. So what I can do is I first compute or 100, for 100 the Z distribution is going to give me the full area from here till here, right, it is going to give me the full value first. Then I compute for 80, the 80 it is going to give me this area, subtract the 2 that will be this area of interest, that is the probability that a car picked at random it may be between a speed of 80 to 100, okay. Now, how many of you got 
चलान फॉर ओवर स्पीडिंग ओके वॉट इज द स्पीड एट विच यू आर ड्राइविंग यू फॉर हंड्रेड यू गॉट हाउ मेनी पीपल डू यू थिंक यू वुड वॉन्ट टू इफ द आर टी ओ गवर्नमेंट और वट एवर इज अथॉरिटी इफ यू आर अ पर्सन इन दैट एंड यू वॉन्ट टू वर्क विद फुल सिंसियरिटी वट परसेंटेज ऑफ पीपल यू वुड लाइक टू पेनलाइज तो फिर तो बैलगाड़ी भी लेंगे तो भी उस है। है 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 ना 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 ओके Anyone else? No, you are telling hundred. See, you are. No, I am not saying. I am saying hundred violators. No, 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 no. I am. I am not defined violators. I. No, no, no. Okay, let me. Of the people driving vehicle on the road, what percentage of people you would like to penalize? Ten percent. Five percent. That wouldn't be my criteria. Five percent. Wouldn't penalize. you want to penalize 5 percentage of people if given the data point you want because what you are trying to say is there are 5 percentage of people who rash drive okay so you want to penalize them driving at 100 is not a crime you have made nice cemented roads you have made four four lanes five five lanes on either side then what is the purpose right Yeah, let it get recorded. <laughs> Now, what is the purpose? The purpose is that people should drive. If you drive too slow, if you drive too slow, then too it will lead to accident. Right? That is the problem. So, what is the optimal speed you want to know? So, you, if you say you want to penalize five percentage. If five percent is what you want to penalize, because you feel five percentage might be Rash drivers, then give me the speed limit. That's a problem. So you want to penalize five percentage of the people. Statistically, now you arrive. What should be the speed limit? Huh? All numbers are given in front of you. All numbers are given. It's a normal distribution. See, you have got this thing reader going on. No, you are capturing data of all people who are driving. With the context of this, what does the point of thing is? Why use analytics? When you when you are capturing data, see, at one point of time, roads were not good, quality of vehicles were not good. Okay, you had narrow lanes. Now you have got four lanes, five lanes, good quality roads, tire quality has improved. Okay. Then if I keep a speed limit of say sixty, will it work? Right? It will not work. So statistically, you capture, you got statistics. Not everyone is driving rash, right? Many people. I don't drive typically above hundred. The moment I drive above hundred, I feel okay. It's are uh, going out of my control. So there is a science. By science, you say okay. Hey, this is what I should want a optimal limit. Point zero five. Okay. Point one six. Ninety. Yeah. Five hundred. Ninety. There can be one number coming. Ah, huh? someone is saying eighty six will be the speed. So first, in this case, what you will have to get? First, you have to get the z value, because now you know the p value. You know p value is ninety five. 
five percent you want to penalize. So if I make a graph, if I make a graph, first I need to know this is my non-rash traverse. So corresponding z. So see what is the corresponding z coming? It will come one point nine six because ninety five is actually one point nine six. I said you, right? One point six five. So 1.65. So Z value is coming 1.65. So I got the Z. Z is equal to 1.65. I know X minus mu divided by standard deviation is equal to Z. Z is known. Mu is known. Sigma is known. X is unknown. Okay. Compute. X. So, in that case, the calculation will come out to be ninety-six point. Ah, uh, mean is seventy. Sorry. In that case, the speed limit will come out to be eighty-six point five or rounded eighty-seven kilometer. Okay. So. There is a statistical way of also arriving at these kind of things. Make sense? Now, once you have arrived things statistically, you can have then reverse statistics. In the month, how many people, how many vehicles passed through this? How many people got penalized? You can again cross check. Right? Okay. So with that, we uh, we conclude. And uh, those who would like to run things in Python, though we have done this calculation using uh, the statistical learning book, but if you want to do it through Python, you can use the stats package of Python. You can put x mu standard deviation, compute the z score, and then use normal cumulative density function, and you get the p value. This is how you can do. So the calculations in Python is also given to you. If you want to do in Excel, the Excel functions are also given to you. The norm dot dist, norm dot standard dot dist p value. This is from the Excel functions. So here these are Excel functions. Here you got the Python calculation. Here you got the Excel calculation. So I've given you Excel as well as Python, and using the book, pen and paper. Anyways, we have solved. Okay. This is just an additional Gyan slide left for you to do on your own. Okay, with this we complete the central limit theorem and the normal distribution. After session, next session we will see hypothesis testing. Thank you.